We're continuing our studies in Chapter 17, Lipid Metabolism, and in this lesson we want to look at generating longer chain fatty acids and also regulation of fatty acid synthesis. To generate longer chains, we use enzymes that are referred to as elongases. This allows us to, to extend fatty acid chains beyond the 16 carbons we find in palmitate. There are also enzymes called desaturases, and these enzymes introduce double bonds. This usually occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. So we can use different combinations of these elongases and desaturases, and that gives us uh, fatty acid chains of varying lengths and degrees of saturation. We won't be looking at this in any detail. Mammals cannot introduce double bonds beyond carbon number 9, and so these are the essential fatty acids that must be supplied in the diet. So what about those trans fats? Well, remember what we discussed in lecture, elevated LDL levels are linked to atherosclerosis, and the amount of lipids or fats that we take into a diet, our diet does seem to influence the serum levels. Remember, saturated fats seem to increase LDL, whereas unsaturated lower LDL. The, we've known this for some time, and so manufacturers began with unsaturated fatty acids, but then we don't really want to pour oil on our toast in the morning. We want a solid fat, and so they took those unsaturated fatty acids and hydrogenated them to make them solid. This would be good, right? Unfortunately, some of those double bonds were converted from the natural cis configuration to trans. Remember, beta oxidation begins with, for unsaturated chains, a cis configuration. These also seem to contribute to high LDL levels and therefore to atherosclerosis. Still, the verdict is out. There's still a great deal we don't understand about the connection between the different types of fatty acids and how they influence our metabolism. What we do know is how fatty acid synthesis is regulated. So let's look at that. It's controlled at the first step, catalyzed by acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Remember, that's the enzyme that generates our malonyl-CoA substrate. It is feedback inhibited by palmitoyl-CoA. Remember, that's the end product of the pathway. And so if that builds up, it feeds back and inhibits acetyl-CoA carboxylase. It's also activated by citrate. Remember, this is our carrier molecule that brings those acetyl groups across from the matrix into the cytosol. And so if we have high levels of citrate, it indicates we have plenty of acetyl-CoA and we can use those in fatty acid synthesis. The enzyme acetyl-CoA carboxylase is also allosterically regulated by adding and removing phosphoryl group in response to hormone signals. Malonyl-CoA also blocks beta oxidation. It does it in this way. Remember, malonyl-CoA is the product of the acetyl-CoA carboxylase step. It's also our substrate in fatty acid synthesis. So when synthesis is in full swing, uh, this, the production of malonyl-CoA, it binds to carnitine acyl transferase and prevents us from transferring that acyl group to carnitine and moving it over into the matrix for beta oxidation. In other words, we don't want to make the fatty acid chain and then transfer it into the matrix so that would then we break it down in beta oxidation. We don't want these two opposing pathways operating at the same time. And our malonyl-CoA substrate builds up and therefore shuts down that transporter so that we retain our fatty acids that we're synthesizing in the cytosol. In our next video lesson, we want to see the products of ketogenesis and we'll see how this can be used as fuel.